Hello, today is November 17th, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Augie Chase. Welcome, Augie. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Could I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in South Carolina, Greenville. What when? Yeah. October 19th, 1922. And did you grow up there? I, yes. And did you graduate from high school there? Yes, I did. And what year did you graduate from high school? 1939. And then did you go to work or to college? What did you do back then? No, I went to work. Uh, that was during the Depression, of course, and my family was very poor. So I took a job uh, taking care of a child for a cousin of uh, a cousin of mine for a year, and then I went to work in a nylon factory that uh, was for the military. So we were. Uh, screened as though we were going into the military when we went to work there. Did you have other friends work with you? Yes. My uh, sister and my next door neighbor, the girl I grew up with. And when you say you were screened, they did background checks on all oh, of yes. you? Oh, yes. Yes. And had it, what kind of factory was it before the, the war? It was just a uh, Some sort of manufacturing company? Yes, or? it was a manufacturing, uh, I think just regular cotton uh, cloth, but they, they turned it into nylon for the military. And they were making what? Parachutes, Parachutes? and other things. I don't really know what. Uh, and was it mostly women working with you? No, men and women. Mm -hmm. Young women like yourself out of high school or all ages? Uh, all ages, up to retirement age. Where are you currently living? I live in, in uh, 21 Jefferson Street in Natick. I've been there for 50 years. And your marital status? I am a widow. And any children? I have one son. Any grandchildren? No, unfortunately. After you were in the nylon factory, how long were you there for? I was there until I joined the uh, Navy. And when, where and when did you join the Navy? February 1943 in Greenville. Why? Why did you join? Well, there was all this uh, talk on the radio by the president and others that you should help out during the war. There were uh, billboards, the Navy wants you, the Army needs you, and I saw the, uh, on the way to work every day, I saw this billboard with this wave in uniform saying, Uncle Sam, needs you. So my next door neighbor, my friend, she kept saying, you know, we should do something for the war. So finally I said, why don't we join the Navy? I like those uniforms. <laughs> and she said, fine. Now was this the same neighbor that you had gone to the nylon factory with? Yes. So you both joined together? No. What happened? Well, we went to take our test and to be examined. I joined, we came out, and she said to me, I didn't join. What happened? But I was already committed, so. Did she well, decide not to, or? Her reason was, her father had recently died. Her mother was left with two younger children, younger than herself. She said, I can't leave my mother 
with uh, my brother in junior high, my sister in high school. So she decided not to join. How did you feel about that? D oh. I was really upset for a long period. I guess I was upset until I reached boot camp because I had to go alone. Right. And, uh, and where did you go to boot camp? I went to uh, Hunter College in New York City in the Bronx. And had that been the first time you had ever been in New York? Oh, yes. So oh, what yes. was it like for a girl from South Carolina going to New York? Well, it was a little frightening to go especially alone, but uh, of course they provided me with a ticket and that's the first time that I had ever had a uh, sleeping berth on a train. Of course, during the war, everyone traveled by train. And uh, I had my uh, meal ticket, my sleeping berth, and uh, started one day and reached New York first thing the next morning. And leaving home, who were you leaving behind? What family members? I left my father, my two brothers, and my sister. I was the only member of the military at that time. Someone asked my father, how many boys do you have in the service? My father said, well, all the boys I have in the service are girls. <laughs> <laughs> my younger brother was in high school. My older brother was unable to, he had a heart condition. Mm -hmm. He tried every branch of the military, he was rejected by everyone. Because of his medical condition? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Was your father concerned about you or proud or both? Oh, very concerned. He said, you know, I can't come and rescue you. If you join this, you'll have to stay there until you're discharged. And there's nothing I can do for you. You'll be homesick. Well, I was homesick, but. But you did it. I did it. And when you were in Hunter College, um, was it all women with you? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And were you given dorm rooms or were you in a group area? Well, we were in the uh, housing for the college. And uh, afterwards, I heard that uh, the Navy had to pay Hunter College umpteen thousands of dollars because all the flooring had to be uh, removed and, uh, uh, you know, new flooring put in because we washed the floors so much, we ruined them. Every day you swabbed the deck. So. Sure. How long were you in training? Three weeks. And what, what was it like? What was it on a daily basis? Well, you got up, you had uh, chow, breakfast, and uh, you uh, had uh, drills oh, about twice a day, and you had classes, you know, to identify ships and flags and et cetera, planes, uh, and just, you know, Navy, rules and regulations the rest of the time. But you had a full day up until evening chow at six o'clock. And then did you have your evenings to yourself or? Were yes. You, and you were confined to the college or? Oh you? yes, we were confined. We, uh, we were there three weeks and we were given Sunday to uh, go into the city. None of us girls knew how to, to get the subway. Well, we, of course, went in on the subway. We didn't know where to get off, but some of the New Yorkers told us. And uh, so we got off at Times Square, and I wanted to go see uh, Jimmy Dorsey. He was one of my favorite orchestra leaders, and uh, part of the group wanted to go see another orchestra. See, it was the big band era. Sure. So they were everywhere. So I went to see Jimmy Dorsey, thank God, because I met my husband there. You did? Yes, Tell I did. Tell us about that. Well, there were three of us that went to see Jimmy Dorsey, and we were, uh, had seen the movie, 
Then the band came on, and suddenly one of the girls, we had two, the other two girls with me, one was from Pittsburgh, the other one was from Birmingham, Alabama. So Alabama had turned around and was talking to the, a sailor sitting behind us. There were three sailors sitting behind us. And uh, finally, my husband turned to, came, leaned over to me and he said, why don't you come and sit up here and let him go down and sit with Alabama. So I looked at him and I said, well, it's okay in a theater. I said, okay, so I did. And he wanted to know where I was from and we exchanged past histories for a while. And then when we left the theater, they wanted to take us and get a hamburger, which we did. We went into a drugstore that had a, uh, uh, like a booth or a, a, a soda fountain. Mm -hmm. I'm having a senior moment, pardon me. And uh, so I ordered a soda. Bill turned to me and he said, you won't like that. And I looked at him and I said, what kind of a character is this? I said, how do you know what I would like? And uh, which I teased him about for many years. Was it because you used the term soda? I have no idea why he said that. He so, could never explain why he said that. But uh, Where was Bill from? He was from Natick, he South was from Natick. Natick. Mm -hmm. He grew up in South Natick. And Bill Chase? Yes. And uh, so then we told them we had to get back to the base, but we didn't know which uh, subway car to get. So they said, well, we'll take you and show you. So they rode back to Hunter College with us. And on the way, he asked if he could write to me. And I said, yes, of course. So that started it. And, uh, and the rest was history. The rest was history. Say, and how long yes. were you married? 58 years. And Bill, I understand, passed away. Yes. How long ago? Uh, eight years ago. And I might add here that the local uh, skating rink is named after your husband? Oh, yes. Yes. He well, was involved. Oh, he was the Natick Comets. He was he the He started Comets. the Natick Comets in 1951. So for almost 30 years, we lived in ice skating rinks all over the country. He never passed one up. And of course, that was his he was a barber for 20 years after the war, and he didn't like that, so he went into uh, the business, the ice skating business, which he loved. So and you wrote to each other throughout the war? Yes. And we'll get on about your experiences, but in writing to each other, um, how soon after you met did you marry? Eight months. And how did your family feel about that? Well, my father, Bill wrote my father and said that he had proposed to me and I'd accepted and how he felt about it. So my father wrote him and he said, if she picked you, you must be a good man and I'm sure she'll make you a good wife. I will treasure that remark sure. all my life. And what about Bill's family? Well, I really don't know. Uh, his, he had a, a mother, grandfather, a grandfather and a grandmother and a brother. Uh, I was accepted, but not as well as my family accepted, although I had an aunt that she had us to her home for lunch the first time she met Bill, and she said, he seems like a nice young man, Augie, but I don't understand a word he said. <laughs> <laughs> because of the different accent. Accent, yeah. When you were in training, basic training, um, what were your, if you remember, your likes and your dislikes about it during those three weeks? Oh, I didn't like the 
the drilling was exciting at first, but it came, became quite a chore. And you'd be very tired. No matter how you felt, you still had to hop two, three, four. And uh, that was, uh, and of course I didn't like the uh, shots. We had one, two, three, four shots the same day. And a lot of sick girls that night. And you were getting vaccines and shots because you were, they were planning to s send you in different parts of the country or oh, overseas? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training? No, I did not. And how was it determined on what you were going to be doing? Well, they gave us uh, aptitude tests. And I always said that I knew a hammer from a nail, so they figured that I should go into uh, flight uh, you know, repairing planes. And did you know that right away when you were done with BASIC, that that's what you would be doing? I had no idea. So after your three weeks, what happened? The Sunday evening, we returned from New York. We were told that uh, uh, we would be leaving no, I'm sorry, it was not three weeks that we went, to, it was two weeks we went to New York, that we would be leaving the following Sunday for whatever station we would be. And where was yours? Memphis, Tennessee, Naval Air Station at Millington, Tennessee, just outside Memphis. And how did you get there? Oh, we went by train, 200 girls. And uh, this was a uh, coal burner. And we would have to go off on a siding about every 30 minutes because a troop train would be going through. The troop train had precedence over everything else. And you were shuttled off and had to wait until they passed. So it took us about two days to get to Memphis from New York. And had you ever been to Memphis before? No, I had been to uh, Chattanooga, the only place I had been. I'd gone on a trip to Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I just returned from Chattanooga in September this year. This year you went again? Yes. So what do you remember about Memphis when you first got there? And you were there with some friends. Was Alabama with you, your no, friend Alabama? She no, didn't go with you. None of the girls that I uh, roomed with in uh, boot camp went to Memphis. So you were kind of on your own again? On my own again, yeah. But it didn't bother me in the slightest, no. No, were you every girl was in the same boat. They all were. Yes. W were you considered sort of an adventurer growing up or not? Well, I suppose this is what my uh, family would say, yes, yes. So when you got to Memphis, and it's a naval air station, you said, mm -hmm. um, were you given assignments right away? Were you assigned to specific barracks? What was it like? Well, the wave barracks were not finished when we uh, got to Memphis. So we had to go into a uh, sailor's barracks. And there were a few complaints because there's no privacy whatsoever in a sailor's barracks. The girls didn't like that but that we were told that our barracks would be nicer, which they were. And how long after were you able to get into them? About a month. We were there. And once you moved in, what were you, what were you doing actually once you, you um, got to Memphis? What, what were you doing again on a daily basis? Well, you went... More training or...? No, there was no train... Well, yeah. You would walk in and the uh, first class or the chief would tell you what your duties for the day were and they would show you what they wanted done. Like what? Well, I went into the fabric shop. Our planes were World War II planes. We taught French cadets to fly and uh, who spoke very little English, by the way. I played pool with 
twins, a lot of uh, lunch periods, you know, mess hall lunch periods. And uh, they knew very few words. These were men? Oh, yeah, young. Young men young, from France? From France, oh, yes. And when you say we taught them how to fly, meaning? Well, I didn't teach them how well, to fly. Well, that's what the I wanted to clarify. Right, right. The pilots, there were instructors who taught them to fly. There was a school across the street where they had their book learning and uh, lessons. Then they came across to us. They were housed across the street. They weren't on our base. They would come every morning or evening, you know, whenever they were to fly. And, uh, and in three years, we lost only one young man. He, so they were, he, they were his taught His first well. night, night flying, he flew into some wires and his plane went down. He was killed. That was the only one. So while they're teaching flying and they're learning lessons, these soldiers, what were the girls doing? The girls did everything that the men uh, did because the day we got there, 200 men shipped out. So what were you doing? Were you, you mentioned the fabric shop? Yes. So we. The planes were, as I said, World War II planes, and they were made of wood. The body of the plane was all wood. And this was covered with a linen cloth. And uh, then when it was completely covered, other than the engine, of course, was not, it was metal, and the struts and the wheels, but uh, everything, the body and the Everything else was uh, cloth, and that had to be taken to the dope shop or the paint shop, and seven coats of paint applied, and then it was ready to be uh, put together and put So on you the might line. be what cutting linen, painting the plane. Oh yes, no, not painting. I never, no, no, no. never worked there. It was a horrible place to work because you had those paint fumes. You know the. Eight hours you were there or longer. Now, the, who was doing that? Were, were well, we? those were all sailors. There were no women. In and when the they picture. did that, did they wear masks or anything? I don't believe they did. And I don't think so. So when you're in the fabric shop, what are you doing with the fabric? Are you cutting it? Are oh, you yes, you cut it. And just as though you were making a dress, then you form it on the part that you're covering of the plane, and you stitch it on. Was it like an assembly line? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And so of the 200 that you went down with, were all of you in this shop? Oh, no. 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 Some were secretaries. Mm -hmm. Some were in the hospital. Uh, some were uh, in the log office, keeping logs. I did that for a year of all the pilots, all the instructors, and all the students. Which did you like better? I liked the log office best. I liked keeping the records. So you had to be organized to do that? Well, you had to be organized to do any, any of, of it. it. Or someone would be on your neck. <laughs> so how long were you in Memphis? I was uh, there for two, about two years and seven months because I went after only three weeks in boot camp. It, boot camp is usually six weeks, but they said we were needed, so we left after three weeks. Because the men were being shipped out, Yes, the mentioned. men were being shipped out. So when you went in, what was your rank? A seaman. Then I became seaman first class. When you were in Memphis, you mm, became seaman yeah. first class? And then uh, aviation machinists made third class. And how, how long after you reached Memphis did that happen? Well, about a year and a half. So when you were initially in the fabric shop and then you at some point were in the records area, um, Aviation machinist, you said first class? 
No, third. Third class. Explain that. Third class versus? Well, third class, then you advance to second class, okay. but you must pass tests just as in any schooling to get and then first class. So prior to becoming an aviation machinist third class, did you have to take a test to do that? What yeah. was the test like? Well, all questions about uh, flying, uh, recognizing different uh, planes, different parts, uh, how to assemble, uh, you know, the, uh, oh, so much. I, I really don't remember, you know, but the, you had to know, you know, quite a bit about the uh, workings of an engine or... So when you passed that test, mm -hmm. what did you do then? Were you... I did the same work. Mm -hmm. well, you didn't have another job, you just did the same work. So you just got a little extra pay. Do you remember what your pay was? I don't remember what it was when I first went in, but it was $78 a month when I uh, left. Do you remember if that was equal to what the men were making? Oh, yes. It oh, was. absolutely. Yeah, there was no... Uh, no discrimination no at discrimination. that point. No discrimination. You had the same food. You had the same... The, the uh, uh, uniform, everything. Well. Our uniforms were a little nicer. Now, when you were on the assembly line or in an office, were you, what was your uniform that you wore? Was there a difference between offices? Oh, no. No, no. You, you have the same uniform uh, unless you're an officer, uh, whether you are a seaman or first class. It just, you just wear a... Uh, Badge. Badge, patch, we call it, on, our, you know, on your arm. You know. Now, was your uniform a skirt or were you were in pants? In our, our working uniform was coveralls. And uh, the planes were not jets, of course. They were prop, you know, propellers. And this one poor girl walked out to a, a plane that just started up. And the, the prop wash got her, it ripped the coverall from top to bottom. She but she was okay? Oh, she was fine. Just horribly, horribly embarrassed. <laughs> and then what was your dress uniform? Well, we had uh, dress whites. This was, you saw me in dress whites with the picture here. The, uh, uh, winter uniform was uh, these were designed by Hart Schaffner and Marx. The hats and the uh, uniforms. The uh, winter uniform was navy with a white shirt, navy tie, and uh, the summer was the white uniform with the white shirt and the navy tie. And the uh, you had the uh, Oh yes, we had uh, wool slacks for the winter, and uh, we also had a, for the summer, we had a seersucker dress, or you could get a skirt and a top in seersucker, but I chose the dress. When you went off the, uh, out of the barracks and, and off for some free time, mm -hmm. did you wear your uniforms? Oh, always. always. You never went out of uniform. We were not allowed. You had to get permission to, uh, no matter what the occasion, you were still in uniform. And you could wear either one you wanted, but you had to be in uniform. Were you proud of wearing the uniform? Absolutely. When you did get some free times, was it normally a Sunday still, or was it other days too? Oh no, your time was yours on the base to do what you liked after you finished work for the day. We really didn't have any drills or anything other than inspection on Saturday morning. 
and uh, there you had to make sure that your locker, your bunk, your cubicle, there were eight girls in a cubicle, you had to make sure that everything was ship shape and uh, you were ship shape yourself and you stood in line for a couple of hours, usually about half hour at attention, which is very, very hard to do. Some, I think more sailors fainted than women, though, during that time. So who might be inspecting? Would it have been? Oh, the uh, commanding officer. Who was a man? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, our commanding officer, the waves, well, they, we had a woman. You remember who was uh, president of uh, Wellesley College, McAfee? She was the commanding officer of the waves. And she would come in and inspect? Oh, no, no. She didn't come to inspect. Okay. She, was she was in Washington. But uh, I don't remember our commanding officer's name. No. We, in fact, we had two while we were there, two different ones. But usually the commanding officer of the base, she would be with him, but uh, he would really be, well, they would both inspect. There's such a difference between men in a cubicle, for instance, and women. I don't think men were. I don't. I was never in a sailor's, except where we had to stay in one for about a month. But I don't think they had cubicles. As you see, we had no cubicles per se. We took our lockers and made a cubicle. For privacy? For privacy, okay. yes. What was it like, though? What I was getting at was sometimes it's easier for men to live together than women, maybe historically. I don't have any facts to back that up, but do you remember, did you all get along well? Was it difficult? Uh, some of the, for the most part, yes, we did. Got along very well. We had a few that uh, once in the uh, mess hall, of course, the girls in A&R, that's assembly and repair, and you were in A and R. I was in mm -hmm. A and R. The ones who worked there, when we went to lunch, we might be a little greasy. Our hands might be, you know, oily. And uh, this yeoman, and that's a secretary, worked in uh, the offices. She made a remark about the grease monkeys and she pointed to the girl across the table from her. And our meals, you would go through a chow line and get a tray about so long, about two feet long, and about a foot wide, and choose whatever you wanted, you know, from the line. And uh, when she made the remark to the girl across, she just picked the tray up and <laughs> right in her face. I don't remember what we had other than I know we had vegetable soup. And oh, she was, well, this poor girl got 30 days. She couldn't leave the barracks. The one who threw the tray. Threw it, but we but were so happy she did. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was in the right. She should have done it. Sure. But uh, she, uh, she was, this girl was not in our barracks, so. That we had two barracks. They were side by side, but just a grassy lawn expanse between the two. And, uh, but she didn't have to see her every five minutes, so it didn't continue at all. And I'm curious, did the uh, girl from the secretarial pool ever make a comment like that again, do you oh, think? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. There were a lot of girls there. You know, you didn't see them all the time. You didn't, uh, had nothing to do with the yeoman. Now, when, while you were working, the war was going on, did you hear about what was going on in the war? Oh, absolutely. And how did you hear? Well, we had radios, just as, you know, you would have at home. And if something important happened, they would announce it over the PA system so the entire base would know what was happening. And did you remember any specific announcements? Uh, yes. Uh, 
they announced all important battles, anything that, uh, you know, was of interest, you know, made headlines in the paper. This was all announced. So you knew exactly what was going on at all times. And we're, were you corresponding still with Bill? Oh, yes. And in corresponding with him, where was Bill? Well, he was on Long Island in New York until he went aboard ship about, uh, about 10 months, I think, after I met him. He went aboard ship. He was on a destroyer escort going many, many ports overseas. He went to Europe and Russia and China. And, and at this point, you're married. Yes. Yes. So did you have any kind of a leave after you got married that you could have what we might consider a brief honeymoon? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. We had three days. And uh, it was very short. And then you would both write letters to each other? Oh, yes. Were Every day. Were they censored at all? Every day you wrote? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Were the letters censored at all? Well. I think his were, mine weren't, but uh, I did receive some that had uh, spaces that had been blacked out, so not many, but a few. And then did you continue also to correspond with your family? Of course. Mm -hmm. By yes. letter. And now I hate writing letters because I wrote so many during the war. Yes. Sure. 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 Uh, did you stay in Memphis during your naval career? I had to stay in Memphis. You had to, if you wanted to transfer to another station, you had to find a girl, a wave, with the same rating, did the same work, and had been in the same length of time. And I wanted to go to Hawaii, but of course there was no way that I could uh, get there because I knew no one in A&R, you know, in Hawaii. And when you were in A&R, <clears throat> your day would start early, but your work day would start what time? About Well, every six weeks it rotated. It was either 8 to 4, 4 to 12, or 12 to 8. So it was a 24-hour... Oh yes, 24-hour operation. You have to protect those planes as well as, you know, those are very light planes, so in case of a storm, they might call us out at 2 o'clock in the morning to go to the line to sit beneath a plane and hold it down so the wind wouldn't uh, tip it over and uh, wreck it. So you remember doing that? Oh yes. Many times. So was somebody with you, holding down a plane with you? Oh yes, it would take three or four people to hold the plane down. One little 105-year-old girl could not do that. 105 pound? 105 mean, pounds, right, yes. Right. Yeah. Um, were you given any kind of R&R &R while you were in the service? Uh, well, time off? You, everyone had a leave, you know, after so many months, I had uh, one leave where I went home. I had, uh, well, I received a wire from the Red Cross which said, your husband is dying, come at once. So I ran to the personnel office. My chief told me, go up to the personnel office and get uh, a leave, and uh, so the uh, personnel officer was from Boston, by the way. He said to me, young lady, don't you know there's a war on? And I said, sir, get your men with the guns, your shore patrol, because I'm going over the fence tonight and catch the eight o'clock plane to Boston. Bill was in Boston. They had taken him off the train. He, if he, when his ship came in, if he had just the weekend, he would come home to Natick. 
if he had 10 or more days, he would come to Memphis to see me. And he had gotten on the train to, to come to Natick from Newark, and he passed out. They couldn't revive him. He was unconscious for one week. They never did know what caused this. They thought maybe something he caught in the South Pacific or something. A virus of some something. sort? Yeah. Did he have any after effects from that? Not really. He, on Friday, he regained consciousness. This was Sunday evening when they took him on. And uh, Friday, the doctor came in and Bill said, my mother just told me my wife is coming in tomorrow morning and I'd like to meet her train. The doctor says, well, if you can walk, you can meet her. So he left the hospital Saturday morning and he did, he met my train. What was it like for you getting off the train and seeing him there? Well, I collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I had been under the strain for a week, but uh, then the personnel officer said, I'll give you 72 hours. It was exactly 36 hours from Memphis to Back Bay Station. Now, there was no possible way that I could come and return even if, you know, the train had been ready to pull out, you know, when I got to Boston, back to Memphis. And so one of the uh, officers that I knew was in the office there, so he ran in. He pushed me, literally pushed me out the door. He said, Chase, get out of here. He said, I'll get you the leave. He did. He got me 10 days with four days traveling time. Was the personnel officer a man? Yes. What was his problem? I think he was bitter toward, I don't know what, but he was... Not very flexible. None whatsoever. And you, in doing this, you had to show him the wire that you got, so he knew what the circumstances were. Of course he knew what the circumstances were. He, well, in fact, he said to me, who had this wire sent? I said, my mother-in-law asked the Red Cross to send it. He said, aha. And, but anyway. So he didn't believe. He didn't really believe, mm -hmm. no. And uh, then my husband got 30 days to recuperate. So he went back to Memphis with me. So when he comes back to Memphis with you, mm -hmm. where does he, does he, is he able to stay with you off site or? No, he stayed in Memphis in a hotel, in a hotel. Mm -hmm. and you had to change hotels every three days. Well, I had to do a lot of uh, begging uh, hotel clerks to let us stay three or four days, you know. And all the girls were so nice, they took all my watch time in the evenings so I could go into Memphis every night that my husband was there. To be with him. To be with him. Mm -hmm. And then once his time was up, was he shipped out again? Oh yes, oh yes, for the duration of the war he was. And, and you said he was back and forth to yes. Europe, et cetera? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I meet his, that was why I was in Chattanooga this year, to meet with the, well it was started by World War II veterans uh, that served on this ship. What, his what ship, ship was it? The, uh, USS Savage, and uh, it served in the World War II, the Vietnam War, and Korea. The only ship in the f fleet that ever served in all three wars was the DE. And uh, so w the veterans from this ship started an organization to have a reunion every year. So we meet in different places in the U.S. every year. So you continue the tradition Oh, yes, go. I can continue, yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Do you, um, did you ever have a sense that you might be transferred overseas? Or did oh, you, no. You were no pretty, girls went overseas. They didn't go. No. Mm -hmm. no. And so you were in Memphis. You finished up your time there. 
When or where were you discharged? Were you discharged from there? Yes. All married women were discharged in October once the war was over in August. So October exactly. of? Exactly. 45. 45. And you were discharged in Memphis? In Memphis, yes. And did you come to Massachusetts or did you go no, home? No, I went home. And then uh, my brother-in-law called and said that Bill was on his way home. He had not been discharged, but he had been uh, in Washington State, Fort Lewis. And uh, they were there for a month. And then he came by train to uh, Boston, to Brighton Marine Hospital. He had to have some surgery before he could be discharged. Was this war related or? No, it really wasn't. Uh, he, w he was really in no battles. There were, he saw battles from, you know, different ships in his group. But, uh, and the Savage had gone through what they call bloody winter. In fact, they wrote, his, the, his skipper, John Waters, wrote uh, the book about the winter they'd gone through before my husband joined the ship. And that was in the South Pacific. But he was in uh, the, uh, the Aleutians and, you know, very close to, it was uh, very trying times when he was there, very scary. So he was coming back to Boston. Did he go to the Naval Hospital or where did he go? Brighton Marine Hospital, just a military hospital. And you knew that when you were down in the Carolinas? That well, his brother called and told me that he was coming home. So I came immediately. And uh, then when Bill came home, he said, I have to go into the hospital. So was this the first time you had, had met Bill's family? Yes. No, no, no. Oh, no. You had met them before oh, that? No, I met them before that, yes. So you came up to Boston. Mm -hmm. You're now out of the Navy. Yes. What rank were you? Aviation Navy. machinist, third class. What was it like when you were done and a civilian again? You were a little lost. A lot of uh, uh, both men and women. You have this closeness, this bond with your fellow shipmates. And uh, I had four that I had, that was very close to. And we stayed in touch and three have passed away. The other one I've lost touch with her. I have no idea what happened. Did you join any unit of military reserve after the fact? No. Did you join any veterans organizations? Well, we did for a short while. We joined the American Legion, both Bill and I. Did you receive any veterans benefits? Yes. Yourself? I, yes, I did. So did Bill. He went to Barber School and I went to uh, Hickok Secretarial School in Boston. And did you use that experience in the workforce? Uh, yes, I uh, was uh, secretary cashier at r &L Furniture Company for seven years after I graduated from school. And where was that? Where Debson and what was wallpapers the now. R and L furniture. R and L furniture. In downtown Natick. Yes. What was it like moving to Natick? Well, I don't know that it was that much different than living any place. Did you get to go home a lot? 
or did you more or less stay in the Natick area? Did you go back to the Carolinas at all? Oh, well, no, we didn't go far. We didn't take a vacation for three years because we were in school. Then we were trying to, you know, establish ourselves. You know, money was scarce. And uh, we stayed for three years and finally went well, on a three-week vacation, went home and saw some shipmates and up and down. There isn't a state on the East Coast that we don't have friends. So you would get to see them and oh, you yes. would stay with them? Yes. You would drive down? Yes, we drove. Do you attend any uh, reunions of your group? Never had any reunions that, well, no, I'm sorry. They just had one, but no, I get the news, but I never attended. But you did attend the reunions of your husband's Oh, yes. We went to his ship's reunion. Mostly now Vietnam and Korean veterans. There's only uh, four World War II veterans of that ship left. Only two attend the uh, reunions. How important to you was serving in the military? Very. It was a wonderful experience, and I'm so glad I did. It was boring at times, it was tedious, it was, but I was very proud of my country and uh, so was Bill. We were both very patriotic, so. Do you feel in some way it affected your life going forward? I think so. In what way? Well, it was a broadening experience, and educational, oh and, yes. And I you think. met your husband. And I met my husband. Looking back on it all, was there a, an experience, a memorable character experience, or humorous? thing that really sticks out in your mind? I know you mentioned the, the grease monkey comment, but anything else that was Well, yes, there was one other thing that uh, one of the cute girls, she, you had to be a very good bunk maker. And that was my only rec uh, commendation I got, I guess, was I was called out at uh, roll call one morning, wanted to know to speak to who Chase was. So I walked up to the officer and I was scared stiff. I had no idea what I had done. I kept thinking, you know, what did I do? What did I do all? And she said, I would just like to uh, meet you because I have never met anyone that made such a beautiful bunk as you do. Everything is so precise. I said, well, I had experience in a nursing home uh, working part-time, shown by nurses how you made a bed, and that's why it was so taught. She says, when they tell me you can drop a dime on there and it will bounce, on yours it does. So <laughs> that was my only commendation in the Navy. <laughs> Did any others ha ask you to help them learn how? Oh, they said, yeah, leave it to Chase, you know, to make us all look like idiots. <laughs> or they give you a hard time continuously, you know, you get away with nothing. So this one night, uh, one of the girls went into town and another girl just very carefully pulled back the spread, the blanket and the sheet, top sheet, and poured a Coke bottle full of water in the middle of her bunk. And it seeped right through the mattress. Some of it dropped on the bunk. She had it in the upper bunk. And some of it seeped down below for the poor girl that slept on the lower bunk. So uh, the girl complained to us, you know. She said, I've had a wet mattress all night. Of course, she came home about midnight from Memphis and uh, dived into the bunk because she had to be up at uh, five or six, whatever her time was in the morning to go to work. And so the, we waited 
until the girl that poured the water went into town. So someone, I don't know who, I think it was Dee Dee, one of my friends, who got the idea that we'll use Coke caps. Do you remember the old Coke bottles with the caps? Metal uh, caps. Metal caps, you know? They had teeth. That had, oh yes, serrated edges yes. all around. So we emptied, we had a Coke machine as you went into the barracks and every girl would grab a Coke when she went into the barracks from work or whatever and leave the cap in the uh, container. So we took the container of caps and I and another girl, we put all the caps, you know, very carefully with the crinkled edge up and then put the sheet back very carefully not to disturb them. That girl came from town. She slept all night, didn't feel a thing. <laughs> Her body looked, it was <laughs> patterned from her back, her sides, completely patterned the next morning. She said, I didn't feel anything. He said, you're dead. <laughs> but things like this happened all the time. Keeping it light. Keeping it light, yeah. Well, is there any other comment or finishing up this really neat interview? Is there anything else you want to leave us with as we do complete it? Well, it's been a long time happening, I guess, but I'm glad I did it. Uh, a lot of my friends have been after me to do it, but my father always said, never put yourself forward. You know, let people find out for themselves what you are instead of you sounding your own uh, horn. And uh, if you do something for someone, keep it to yourself because that makes it, they are the ones that get the credit, not you if you go around and expounding it. Well, I think what we've heard is a little bit of history today, too, Augie. And so, Augie Chase, I want to thank you for coming in and sharing your story, both touching and humorous. Thank you well, so thank much. Well, thank you, Joan. It was easy with you. Good, thanks. <laughs>